All right, the author's note. <clears throat> There's nothing like a black man on a mission. No, let me revise that. There's nothing like a black salesman on a mission. He's Superman, Spider-Man, Batman, and any other supernatural, paranormal, or otherwise godlike combination of blood, flesh, and brains. He can't die. Don't believe me? MLK. Yes, Martin Luther King Jr. was a black salesman. In the same way used car salesman hawk overpriced hunks of metal that break down once an unsuspecting customer drives off the lot, our man ML to the goddamn K was a salesman to the highest degree. Not only did he sell black people on the vision of a unified America, but he also sold the, the United States Supreme Court, which at the time contained nine white men, the hardest decision makers for any black man to convince. MLK, Malcolm X, James Baldwin, Jean-Michel Basquiat, and Frederick Douglass were all salesmen. Hell, Nina Simone, Rosa Parks, Harriet Tubman, and every other black woman who achieved any leap of success was a saleswoman. Oprah, hide a BMW under your seat, Winfrey is a saleswoman. You get the point. Each and every one of these people was selling something more precious than gold, a vision. A vision for what the world could look like if millions of people were to change their minds. The hardest thing to change. How do I fit into all of this? When will I shut up and get to the point? Don't worry, I'm getting there. I'm a black man on a mission. No, I'm a black salesman on a mission. And the point of this book, which I'm writing from my penthouse overlooking Central Park, is to help other black men and women on a mission to sell their visions all the way to the top. So high up that I'll have to crane my neck like one of those goofy white people in films deciding whether a superhero is a bird or a plane just to catch a glimpse of them before they're out of sight. Whoosh, bang, poof. The great disappearing act of success. My goal is to teach you how to sell. And if I'm half the salesman every newspaper, blog, and hustler in New York City says I am, then you are in luck. With my story, I will give you the tools to go out and create the life you want, to overcome every seemingly impossible obstacle, to fix the game. Which game, you ask? We'll get there. But before we do, I'm going to ask you to do three things. One, let down your guard and open your mind to what I'm going to tell you. I know we're strangers right now. You're likely asking yourself why you should trust me. The good thing is that you already bought this book, so you trusted me enough to part with $26. I'm going to let you down. Two, understand that I want all people to be successful. But in the same way that Starbucks can't just give out mocha frappuccinos to anyone who doesn't have $14, I can't help everyone. So I'm starting with black people. If you're not black, but have this book in your hands, I want you to think of yourself as an honorary black person. Go on, do it. Don't go don black face in an afro, but picture yourself as black. And if you want, you can even give yourself a fancy black name like Jamal, Imani, or Asia. Three, say every day is deals day and clap your hands. I know it's strange, but do it. And when you do, think of the number one thing you're working toward. It may be a new car, a promotion, someone's affection, or an expensive pair of shoes. Whatever it is, think of it and say, every day is deals day. And clap your hands as loud as you can. As you'll find out, every day is deals day. A day without deals is like a camel without humps. It doesn't exist. At this point, your heart's beating and there's a twinkle in your eye. I know because I've given this speech before. I've given it to myself. I've given it to thousands of people wanting to change their lives. And I've given it to people who didn't know they wanted to change, but needed it. A long time ago, I was one of these people. I was like you, ambitious, but afraid. Intelligent, but impotent. Curious, but cowardly. I was all of this and more. But freedom, true freedom, the kind where you do what you want without fear comes at a cost. It's like my urban corner philosopher, come fairy, God Uncle Wally Cat used to say, you can change the hands of a clock, but you can't change time. I can give you the tools to change, but only you can change yourself. And if I'm successful in teaching you how to sell and fix the game, I ask that you buy another copy of my book and give it to the friend who needs it most, who is stuck like I was and in need of a way out, who is blind to the game but has potential just like you. Does that sound fair? If so, and if you can do the three things I outlined above, then we have a deal. And if we have a deal, it's time for you to do one last thing. Turn the page. Happy selling, Buck. So that's the beginning of this novel. That's how we kick it off. A little bit intense. The intention is to acclimate the reader uh, with the author of the book, not myself again, but Darren Vender, who is later on called Buck, as well as to convey the tone of the book, um, as well as to 
give the vibe that it's not just going to be an engaging narrative, but that in some ways it's going to also function as a sales manual. In terms of how this book came to be taking a step back, um, I was working at a startup and I was there for almost four years. It was in Manhattan, New York City. And um, it's actually the same building where this book takes place. <laughs> I didn't think that I had to reinvent the wheel. I set uh, the startup in this book in the same exact building that I used to work in. It's not the same startup one for one. There's a disclaimer at the beginning of the book. So anyone watching this, if I worked with you in the past, you can't sue me. It's not the same company. But I was working there and I'd been there for a handful of years. I had power, I had status, I had money. I was, I was young, I was 24, managing around 30 people, uh, a lot of the cold callers. And I became disillusioned with that world of sales and startups. I no longer felt as though the company I was working at and their values were in line with my own. So in the beginning of 2016, I began to write. Um, I was writing articles about startups and sales because it was what I knew best at the time and published them on different blogs and, and websites. And it was in May of that year of 2016 that I began writing fiction. And I realized for me, writing fiction wasn't just an outlet, but it was a very specific form of salvation. So I began writing this manuscript, not knowing what I was doing. I don't have a formal writing background. I don't have my MFA, but I knew that it felt good. And that for the first time in a long time, I felt free. So I wrote this manuscript. Um, it took me a couple months and I quit my job just because I couldn't be there anymore. It wasn't like, oh, let me quit. And then all of a sudden I'm going to get an agent and a book deal, even though that's what I wanted to happen. I, I quit because I could no longer be there. So I left, I had some savings and I went to travel. I got a one-way ticket to Costa Rica. Um, I had just finished my first manuscript right before I got there. And <laughs> I'm laughing because what I'm gonna tell you, I, I could be embarrassed about it, but I only am a little bit. I get to Costa Rica and I say, okay, I've done some research. I need to get a book agent. So what I do is I Google best literary agencies in America and I email their presidents. And I say, I got this book. And it wasn't Black Buck. It was a different book. I said, I got this book. Here you go. You know, offer me representation. There were even times when I called them up, right? For, for, those of, for those of us who know, you don't call up literary agents. But I said, I used to call up titans of business and get them, you know, within 30 minutes to 45 minutes to give me their credit card. So, of course, I'm going to call these agents. I'd call up. I'd say, hello, this is uh, Mateo, blah, 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 blah. Hang up. Why are you calling? Email. So I reached out to a bunch of these presidents and I got a bunch of rejections. But one thing that I learned from the world of sales is that uh, a rejection is just a means to an end. So I had somewhat of an advantage because it wasn't so piercing when these people told me that they didn't want my work or that it wasn't right for them and so forth. Or in some cases, I just never got a response. So after doing a little work on that first manuscript, I ended up um, finally, you know, coming up with a list of agents that I thought this would fit with. And nine of them requested to look at it, but I didn't get any offers. The writing wasn't good enough. The pitch was, but the writing wasn't. So at this point, um, I'm now consulting with some tech startups like here and there just to make some money. And I said, you know what? I don't need to be in the States. So I travel again. And while I was traveling, um, I began reading this book called Plot and Structure by a man named James Scott Bell. And I came to that book because one of the agents who rejected my first manuscript said, Mateo, I feel like you might have something here, but you need to work on plot and structure. So I did this really thorough investigative way of trying to learn plot and structure. And I just Googled plot and structure. And I found the first book that came up and it was called Plot and Structure. And fortunately, it worked out. Uh, I learned a lot from that book. It felt as though the man James Scott Bell was walking me through um, how to write and the ins and outs of how one writes a story in a compelling and engaging way uh, that keeps the reader gripped from the beginning to the end. So with that, uh, I wrote a second manuscript based off of the first, but it was very different. I plotted the hell out of it. It was outlined from beginning to end. And I finished it came back to the States and I told myself, I'm not leaving again, right? No more traveling. I'm very serious about this writing thing now and I can't leave until I get an agent. So with that second book, pitched it, had six agents who wanted to look at it. I said, this is it. I wrote it for an agent. Ah, I'm going to get it. <laughs> Didn't work out. Nope. Um, <laughs> just a bunch of rejections, no offer representation. So now it's November, 2017 and I'm in a place of what I call creative rock bottom. 
it is a necessary humbling. And I, I'm asking myself for the first time during this literary journey of who did I think I was? That I could go from this world of startups and sales and write a book and then have it published. Who did I think I was? I had friends looking at me saying, this writing thing really isn't working out, man. You try to come back to the world of startups and sales, maybe start your own company or maybe just become a director of sales somewhere else. But it was at that point that I had to have a conversation with myself. And I said, it doesn't matter whether it takes five months or five years, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to get it published, but I'm no longer going to pander to the industry. I'm not going to try to write just to get an agent, even though of course I want one in a book deal, but I'm not going to write in a way that I think people want me to. Um, I'm going to write the book that I want for the people that I wanted to serve in the way that I want. And it was January 8th, I remember that evening, even though I don't write at night, that I penned that author's note, which I read for you today, um, and which is largely unchanged from that night when I wrote it. And that was the beginning of Black Buck. And fortunately it worked out. And here I am getting an introduction from Phil, <laughs> and uh, sitting in front of all of you today. So that's just a little bit of my journey. Um, I don't know if people would like to unmute themselves and begin asking questions that you might have about publishing or the book itself or comments, um, or Phil has questions, you know, I'm here for all of you. That was great. Mateo, I really appreciate you, you uh, sharing that with us. And I also appreciate you sharing with us uh, how difficult it is, um, not even necessarily to achieve success, but to, to, to write a book mm -hmm. uh, and, the, uh, and how difficult the revision, the revision process is. You know, I think it's really important for students to hear that, uh, you know, failure is really part of the process. Yeah. You know? And um, I would like to, one question I'd like to ask you, you know, I mean, I feel like most good books, and it sounds like this good book, you know, did the same thing to you. Most good books have a tendency to almost break the writer at some point, mm. you know, and in that last, you know, in that last shot through what came to be Black Buck, um, what do you think was, or what do you remember as, or what can you share with us as maybe like, one of the hardest things to nail down, you know, whether it was a certain plot arc or whether it was a certain emotional truth or whether it was a certain character, you know, character development, what was, what was the hardest thing that you had to kind of work the hardest for in that last draft that you, you know, that. Um... Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, that breaking point that you bring up, Phil, um, I had reached that before I began Black Buck. Um, with those first two manuscripts having not worked out and me reaching that place of serious self-doubt, um, I had to ask myself what I was doing and who or what I was even doing it for. So once I gained clarity, I felt free. I was going to write um, the book that I wanted. So with Black Buck, I, and some readers read the book and feel this, right? I was having a lot of fun. Um, I didn't have anyone really in my head as I was writing um, other than, you know, some of the people that, that I hoped would read this book and that it would serve and benefit. But mostly I was just writing um, in a frenzy, in, but, it, but in a positive frenzy. And I was looking to have fun on the page and hopefully convey the, the feelings that I had while writing to the reader. Um, the ups and the downs. But one of the, the first points of difficulty, I suppose, was realizing that I wasn't writing about myself. Darren and I do share similarities. We were both in sales, right? We're both black. I lived um, around the corner from where he lived in bed -Stuy when I was on the come up. I didn't grow up there. Um, but when I was on the come up working at that startup that I told you about, when I was interning there, before I ever did anything regarding sales, I lived in bed down the street from the four corners where the book takes place partially. And those who have read the book know. So we have similarities, but we're also not the same person. So I had to realize and then remember that throughout the process that I wasn't giving the blow by blow of my own history. And it was important for me not to do that because I believed that I needed distance in order to write the book the way it needed to be written so that people could relate to it in the way that I wanted them to relate to it. Um, so that was important for me. And I blurred the lines a lot. I blurred the lines even when I said that I set the book in the place that I used to work. The lines are constantly being blurred between reality 
absurdity, the satirical elements where um, I knew that I was leaving myself as the author, right? Removed from Darren Vender being the author of this book, you know, telling it through his, through his lens. I knew that I was leaving myself exposed in a way um, to misinterpretation, but I was okay with that risk because I said that um, if people misinterpret my intentions or what I'm doing, so be it. I'd rather put the responsibility on the reader to read this book and feel so many things and think so many things and then come to their own uh, conclusion of what's what, what is real, um, how is this making them feel, how are their own lives reflected in this narrative or not, or even in the greater narrative of our nation and world. So um, those are some of the things that I had to work through while, while, while writing the book. Thanks, that was great. If anyone else wants to share a question, I, I just wrote in the chat that folks can write in in the chat or they can unmute themselves and ask. Uh, yeah, uh, please write in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, I will gladly take any questions. I see a question from Jesse Smith. How do you know when you're ready to write professionally? That's a great question. Um, hmm. I like relating back to my journey. I don't think that I ever said I'm going to write professionally for me, right? Only speaking about my own journey. I remember saying, I'm going to take this seriously. And from that moment on, when I said, I'm going to take this seriously, and it's not going to be a side hustle, a side hobby, even though I never considered it that. The, the thing that I considered it um, before I began really taking it seriously was that it was an outlet for me and that it was in some ways therapeutic. Then when I transitioned to saying, I'm going to try my best to make this happen, to write something that feels true and then get it published and have it resonate with people, that's when I began calling myself a writer. And I know that some people feel weird calling themselves writers, um, even with people who publish books, even with people who gain accolades and hit lists and, and whatever, however people define success, they still have a certain level of imposter syndrome. But it was important for me when I began to take it seriously to call myself a writer because it was um, a form of me betting on myself. So that I, I can't tell you right when I knew that I was a professional writer, um, but I knew that the moment I began to really pour myself into this and, and, and wanted, wanting to make it part of my life's work is when I took it seriously and when I call myself a writer. It's different for everyone, I suppose. Thank you for the question. Laney, and uh, apologies if I'm not pronouncing it correctly, Laney uh, Kavalowski says, one, can you tell us about the title, any ties to MK Asante who wrote Buck? Two, what writers have influenced your style? Thank you for the, uh, thank you for the question. Um, in terms of MK Asante, no, no connection. I actually, um, after the book was through multiple drafts and we sold it, I had someone uh, reach out to me and say that they saw that there was this other book called Buck on Amazon. And I said, that's that's dope. I got to check it out. So no real connection. I haven't read it yet. But in terms of the title, there are many meanings to the title. Um, for people that are especially of an older generation, they'll see the title and be a little, they'll, they'll be taken aback. They'll say black buck. I know the historical connotation of that word. You know, what's this book about? Uh, maybe I should read it. Maybe I shouldn't. And, and what have you. Um, the title has many meanings. One is that, um, Sorry, I was just seeing more questions come up. I'll answer those, those in a second. One is the fact that uh, the protagonist, his name is Darren, but he's, re he's renamed Buck and he's black. The second is that he worked at Starbucks. The third is that there's the concept of wealth inequality and black and, and brown people attaining a certain level of financial freedom, black bucks. And the fourth is the historical connotation. For those who don't know, the black buck uh, is what, um, people during enslavement and the enslavers would call the enslaved male who they believed was going to burn down the plantation, steal the women, steal the animals, and basically, you know, for lack of a better term, fuck shit up. So with this book, my protagonist, Darren, he is not burning down, he's not literally burning down these workplaces, but he is burning down what they symbolize and what it means to be um, a minority in these places. 
So that's where the title comes from. And the title is doing a lot of different work. Um, I didn't come up with it, or excuse me, I didn't decide to use that term in order to provoke. It was more so a form of reclamation and because that's the energy that is coursing throughout uh, every page of this book. So thank you for that question. In terms of number two, what writers have influenced my style? Ooh, uh, many. One that definitely showed me that I could write a book like this that some people describe as wild um, or, uh, or a wild roller coaster ride was Paul Beatty. His book, The Sellout, I had read that before writing Black Buck. And I don't even know if I had the idea for Black Buck at the time, but I read The Sellout. And as I was reading, I said, This shit is crazy. This is wild. And not only was it published, but it won the Man Booker Prize. And this is me before I ever really knew that much about the literary industry, but I knew um, what it meant to be able to publish something like that and have people have it resonate with people. So that in some ways gave me permission to write a book like this. Um, of course, you know, I had read James Baldwin and whenever I read James Baldwin, I felt very angry. Um, I had to be careful when I would read uh, Baldwin because it, his words were really, um, transformed the way that I would look at the world for at least, I don't know, a week or two. So I had to be careful, but the emotion that he would evoke, that's always stayed with me. Um, and then there's other people as I was reading Black Buck, excuse me, writing Black Buck, um, whether it was the first draft or second or third, that helped me realize that while I hoped to be writing something original, I was also writing part of a larger tradition. People like John A. Williams, Chester Himes, Ann Petrie, Charles Johnson, um, a lot of these people, right, who are black writers, who some folk don't know about, uh, because all that we're really told or fed about, um, justifiably in some ways, right, is Toni Morrison, James Baldwin, um, you know, Langston, Zora Neale Hurston, people like that, Richard Wright, and so forth. But um, through certain writers and people that I'd met in my journey, they just pulled back the veil on a whole world of, of black writers. So when I was reading them, um, as well as some non-black writers like Philip Roth, my world was just opened up and it helped me in, in, in my own book and, and helped me saw what was possible. Um, thank you for the question. Martin Shirk, did you work with an agent in getting black buck and did your original approach find that agent? So I did get an agent through black buck and um, I use their traditional approach. I'm not going to say the original where I was basically just like querying blindly. It wasn't that. By the time I was writing Black Buck, I knew so much more about the industry. I knew so much more about what it meant for a book to be published. And while, right, it paled in comparison to what I know now, I knew a few things. One, that you have to curate your list of the agents that you're going to reach out to. And there are many ways you can do this. You can use hashtag MSWL on Twitter, which if you use that hashtag, you will see just so many tweets from agents that had very specific requests for specific stories. There's manuscriptwishlist.com or .org. I never remember what it is. And you can see a list of agents in terms of what, they, what they're looking for and, and the books that they haven't even published, but that they like. Um, I also use Publishers Marketplace, which you can pay $25 a month for, and you can see the deals that agents have already closed and the books that they've already sold. I built my list um, primarily from that because I wanted the agent that I worked with to have a, a real track record. Um, so uh, one second, I'm gonna get to your question, Jesse. So <laughs> that, that's a funny that's a funny one. We're gonna get there in terms of how much does it cost to get published. So that's the way that I curated my list. And I think my list had like 30 to 40 people. And uh, what was most important other than curating your list is putting together a query letter. And for those who don't know, your query letter is basically a pitch letter where you tell the agent at the top of the, the letter why you're reaching out to them specifically. You have to personalize it. Two, you're going to spend, you know, two to 300 uh, words on a, a synopsis. And the synopsis, the synopsis has to be gripping. It's the agent's first interaction or introduction to your writing. Then you do some comparison titles, whether it's to other parts of literature or movies or, or whatever you think is apt. Um, you're going to talk about word count and then a little bit of who you are and how that's relevant to this story. Send it off and hope that you get a response, even if it's a rejection. So that's what I did. And fortunately, it worked out. I got a few different offers from different agents and the, the uh, agent who I ended up signing with, I went with her um, 
and I found her through Publishers Marketplace, but I went with her because she was an editor for 20 years. And I said, all right, she's been, she was an editor for 20 years and she will know how to speak with editors. She will know editors. Um, she might be able to help me in the editorial process. I just felt as though it would be an advantage and it was. Two, she acquired Colson Whitehead's two first books when she was an editor. And that spoke volumes to me. I said, whoa, she acquired Colson Whitehead's two first books, The Intuitionist and John Henry Days, which I had already read. I said, this is definitely going to help me in some way and she knows what she's doing. The third thing, that spoke to me most deeply was that she said, you know what, Mateo, when I read this book, it sounds like it's a sales manual. I almost fell flat on my bottom because I had never articulated that to anyone, right? Outside of my mind at that point. So when she said that, I said, she understands this. This is someone who I wanna be with. I didn't sign with her immediately. I had to do my due diligence and give other agents that had the book uh, the chance to give me an offer or not. But I signed with her and then uh, we worked together on the book for about five months and then we sold it. So segueing into, thanks for the question, Martin. Se segueing into Jesse's question of how much does it cost to get published? Um, it should really cost you nothing, right? And, and it depends because I learned a little bit more during my journey, but if any agent ever says you need to pay them for them to represent you, that's what we call a schmagent. <laughs> they're, not, they're not legitimate. You, you should never have to pay an agent to represent you. You should never have to pay a publisher to take on or sell your book. It's different if you're self-publishing. If you're self-publishing and you have a team of one, basically, you do have to pay people to edit it. You have to pay people to copy edit it. You have to pay designers. Um, you have to pay people that are actually going to uh, manufacture the book or in some, in some situations, you don't pay them anything. They just take a cut and it's being sold through Amazon. But to traditionally publish a book, you should never have to pay anyone other than if it is like an early reader or um, a professional editor who's not your actual editor who's, who's representing the book, but someone whose opinion or notes you wanna get beforehand. Hopefully that helps, Jesse. Thank you for the question. Other questions, we're on a roll right now. We're, we, we had a lot coming through. Please do not be shy. Um, as you can tell, I'm an, only, I'm an open book. No pun intended. Another one from Jesse. Do you only stick to novels or have you considered writing for media like games and TV? I've never considered writing for games, but definitely for TV. Um, knock on wood, Black Buck gets to the screen. Uh, we've been in conversations with people over the last year. And if it does get to the screen, then uh, I believe it'll take the form of, of a TV show. And while I found that Hollywood likes to sideline the authors and the people whose material they're adapting, um, that's not going to happen with me. I'm going to have some, some hand in it uh, because I want to learn more about that industry and maybe down the line, even though I can't really conceive of it now, there, I might have an idea that I don't want to write first in book form and would rather put it into um, a screenplay or try to pitch it as a TV show or something. Thank you for the question. Others. Hollywood doesn't seem like it would like your commentary. Jesse, I want to get more on your take because I'm, I'm curious about where you're coming from with that, but you could be right. Time will tell. We'll see. Curious about you featuring Robert Jones Jr.'s The Prophets Behind You. Have you read it? I have read it. And I think that it is masterful. I don't mean to use all these literary buzzwords, but um, this book, when I read it, I was like, damn, he is doing so much on so many levels that this is a book I'm definitely gonna have to read multiple times. And it also took me a while to get through it because every sentence, it took him 14 years to write it. Every sentence, I could tell that um, it was not just doing one thing, it was doing many things. And I wanted to get the uh, multiple meanings behind the sentences. Our books also came out on the same day, January 5th. And uh, Robert and I um, began a dialogue a couple of weeks before our books came out. And he has become someone who uh, I go to if I have thoughts or I just need to really let it out about the process or what I'm experiencing and vice versa. We hit, we, we hit each other up, we support each other's work and uh, we even had an event together. And we don't live too far from one another in Brooklyn. So when uh, he's all vaccinated or I'm all vaccinated and the pandemic um, has improved, then we will hang out on a Brooklyn stoop and just kick it. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, now we're getting some questions. Let's go, all right. Uh, Joaquin Reed, 
Um, if I had an idea and what I want to write a book about, how could I stretch that so it's a book and not a short story? Hmm, this is a good one. I've thought about this. Hmm. Let me take a second. I don't want to always just like give a response. I want to be thoughtful about this. Um, I guess it's about, first of all, what your intention with the work is, right? What do you want it to do? And then asking yourself, do you think your, your intentions would be better, better served through it being a short story or a novel? That's one of the first things I would ask. And you are able to answer that question through having read many short stories and short story collections and novels, right? For me, uh, when it was that 27 turning points I told you about when I was at Creative Rock Bottom, a book that helped me, I know it's a book that maybe many of you have read or I know many of people, many people have, On Writing by Stephen King. And one piece of just like non-esoteric, non-BS advice he gave in it is that the best way to become a better writer is to write more and read more. So I said, okay, I can do that. I'm definitely going to read more than I ever had before. And I did. Um, I'm going to consume more art than I ever had before. And I did. And it helped to tune my, my creative sensibilities. So that's why I say you will be in a better position to know whether you should um, uh, manifest or, or, or bring an idea to fruition as a short story or a book just through reading and becoming attuned to the, the rhythm um, and the breadth of a short story or novel and what it takes to, to get ideas across through them. Um, I'd also ask yourself is, do you want to spend years? <laughs> do you want to spend years on, on an idea? Of course, you're not married to anything. If you spend a year writing a book and it doesn't pan out or you don't like it, you can throw it out. That's what I did with, with my first two manuscripts. But to undertake a novel, you have to have the level of stamina for it. It's not easy. You're coming to this every day or every other day, or I don't know what your writing routine is, and you're committing, at least on the face, to seeing it through for many years. And then when you sell it, then when you, when you have an agent, it's going to take a while to then sell it. And then when you sell it, you're going to be spending at least one and a half to two years before the book even comes out. And at that point, you could be working on something else, but you're going to have to have all these events where you're talking about your other book. So it's a significant investment. I, was, I would ask yourself those questions. For me, whenever I come up with any idea, especially one for a novel, I jot it down on my phone in an app called Evernote. And I'll jot down different ideas. And if I find myself jotting down more ideas over time and a month or two or three or four months down the line, that idea still excites me, then I know that I should probably um, pursue it or I should prioritize it in the uh, list of other novel ideas that I have and then pick from those that, those that I actually wanna write. Hopefully that helps, Joaquin, thank you for the question. Sukena, I think Sukena Dieng, if I mispronounce it, I apologize. How do you deal with good and bad criticism? Does it ever discourage you? Now we're getting deep, okay. Um, it's tough. Something that I learned, and it's not like I always lived it, but I learned while I was working in sales and, and in the world of startups is that um, you shouldn't get too high on praise or too low on criticism. Now, of course, right, I have this book that came out and it was picked for the Today Show. I was on national TV. It's a New York Times bestseller, this, that, and the other. But I'm also, <laughs> I'm also very aware that if I want criticism or to be humbled or grounded, all I have to do is type in goodreads.com <laughs> or go to Amazon and look at reviews. Or I'll have a bookstagrammer who didn't like the book or didn't understand it tag me in um, a critical review, right, of them, of them discussing it. So for me, um, I do get excited when people like the book. I do feel great when I get an email and someone says that it resonated deeply with them and that it, it helped um, them understand that they're not alone or they're not crazy paranoid or overly sensitive when they perceive something in these types of environments to be amiss or that someone gleaned or gained, excuse me, gained tools from this book to help them become better allies. I do love that. It makes me feel good in my heart. Um, and when I do see uh, comments that are negative, I, I do my best not to dismiss them, which might not always be the best because then I do consider them a bit more and they can get under my skin, but I try not to be dismissive. I try to ask myself, is there merit to the criticism, right? Is there something I can learn? Because at the end of the day, it's all information. 
But of course, that's not how it always is in the moment. Sometimes I'll read it. I'm like, I didn't like that. Um, so it just really depends. But at the end of the day, it never really discourages me because I'm very connected to my purpose as a writer. I'm connected to the people that I want to serve. And I know that if I don't write these books that I want to write, then no one else is going to do it for me. Um, so no, I sometimes it gets me down, but it doesn't really discourage me all that much. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. RGDR, do you <clears throat> do other forms of art in addition to writing? How does that inform your writing? Hmm. Um, I like to rap a little bit. Like, I, it's not like I put out songs, but I, I like to make music down the line. Um, I think that in the way that that informs my, my writing is, is that with Black Buck, I read this book aloud to myself. I read every draft. The first draft was 168,000 words. If you read Moby Dick, that's like 50 <laughs> to 100 pages less than Moby Dick probably. It's like the Epic of Gilgamesh or the Odyssey. Um, it was so long. And this book that I have in my hands or more so this is a, an uncorrected proof. So the book behind me, that's like 110,000 words. So um, for me, it was important though, even with that first draft, that was very long to read it aloud because the rhythm, I wanted there to be a rhythm throughout the book and from page to page and sentence to sentence. So when you heard me read that author's note, I hope that you felt some level of a cadence and I believe that I'm in tune with rhythm um, because I just listen to so much music, right? I think a lot of us who listen to music, we put in our 10,000 hours and our ears are attuned to rhythm and then that can help inform our writing. So that's just one example of uh, how I use other forms of art in my own writing. Thank you for the question. Adriana Matos, do you ever find it difficult to separate yourself from your characters, like differentiating between what you would uh, do versus what the character would do. Um, yeah, maybe at times. I'd say at, at times, you know, I'd cringe. If you read the book, then you know what I mean. Like, I would cringe um, at certain actions that Darren, the protagonist, would take or even other people. But I had to remember that um, these characters, I'm, I'm looking to write fully formed three dimensional beings and they have to be free to do what they're going to do. It's sort of in some ways, I don't have a child, but it's sort of in some ways, I believe when a parent has a kid and the kid is acting up or acting out or in certain ways, and they say, let me just give them their space to find out who they are and be themselves. And, you know, hopefully they'll work out the kinks or what have you over time. That's the way that I view these characters in, in certain instances when they were no pun intended acting out of character. Right. We don't always act in the same way that people perceive us to be or how people perceive us to be. So it was important for me to allow characters to do what they were going to do and not judge it and just not play God, even though I am the writer, but more so the facilitator. And that I was able to do that through really trying to understand who are these characters from draft to draft. And as these characters revealed themselves to me further, I knew who they were better. So that if I'm in the fourth or fifth draft, I say, okay, would Darren or Rose or Wally Cat or Clyde or Rhett actually say it in the way that I had written it two drafts ago? Would they actually do this thing? Do I want them to do this thing or not do this thing based on who I know them to be right now because I've, I've gotten to know them over the course of a couple months or so forth. So that would inform the changes in the way that I revise. Um, Martin, thanks for the question. Martin, what's in the pipeline novel-wise? I'm working on another novel, um, slowly but surely. I'm still in uh, promo mode for Black Buck. Um, it comes out in the UK in May, so that's gonna be even more promo, but I am getting to work on this other novel and um, I'm reading other novels to provide blurbs for, having great conversations with people like yourselves, running workshops, um, trying to keep up with social media, doing all these things. So that's what's going on right now. Jesse, would you write fantasy? Sure, what if I have the inclination? Um, I, I, I don't want to limit myself in terms of genre or medium. Um, for people who have read my work before, even if you go to MateoWrites.com, which is like my personal website, and then I have buyblackbuck.com for the book, then you'll see like a dozen, I don't know how many, a dozen and a half, two dozen essays that I've written. Um, I try not to limit myself in terms of form so or genre. So maybe, I don't know, maybe. Thanks for the question. Any others? I think we have 
12 or so minutes left. They've been pouring in thus far. I got more energy. I don't know about you. If any brave soul would like to unmute yourself, um, I'm here. Jesse also said, can I ask how much you pay for the website? So I built it myself. Um, I built buyblackbuck.com myself using Squarespace. It was fairly simple, but they have a lot of tutorials. And then MateoWrites.com, I was using WordPress. Um, the only thing I paid for is uh, like the server or the hosting. And that could be, it really ranges. That could be like 75 to 100 or 120, depending on who you go with every year. Um, also, if you're going to pay for like a Google Apps email, I believe that that's $5 a month. I'd have to look at the numbers. Kayla Nunez or Kyla said, what genre would you like to get into in terms of another book? I don't want to give too much away because I could be revealing the next thing that I'm working on, but sky's the limit. I might write a pure romance. I might write fantasy as Jesse brought up. Um, I might, you know, write a young adult book. Um, I write, I might write uh, a book of poetry or, or what have you. But for me, you know, thinking about Black Buck and um, Phil brought this up that it's never one thing for too long or it doesn't say one thing from chapter to chapter or, or part to part. I like that. I like people not being able to put my book into a box, even though some people label it as satire, which I'd never do, or some people label, label it as this, that, and the other. That's cool. You know, whatever people take away from that, that's, that's on them and I support it. I want there to be multiple reads and, and multiple ways that people categorize this. Um, but it's important for me to um, write something that is never one thing for too long. At least that's where I am right now. Armani, great name. Have you ever felt like you wish you had done something differently as a child or teenager to become a better writer as an adult? If so, what would you do? Hmm. That's a good question. Mm, I don't know. I mean, we all live our lives. And something that helped me is that since I was a kid, or maybe even since I was like a toddler, late toddler, uh, I was very observant. And I was always thinking about my surroundings and people and, and analyzing. Um, I did that a lot as a teenager as well, almost to a fault. So that definitely served me. But I don't know if I would have done something differently. I mean, I lived just as all of us are living. And someone once told me that all of us, just because of the fact that, that we live and that we're alive, um, we have at least one book in us. And maybe some of us have hundreds or thousands and we're not going to be able to get to all of them throughout our lives. So I wouldn't have really done anything differently. Of course, I went through those, those patches when I wasn't reading um, or I'd read one book or a couple books a year. Um, and it wasn't like 2018 when I kicked it into hyperdrive and I read 60. Um, maybe reading more would have made it easier for me to write a book and I wouldn't have had to write three, even though I understand that I did it in somewhat of a short amount of time, but no, I, I don't know if I would have done anything differently. Uh, maybe I would have said live more, <laughs> live, live even more and take more risks. Okay. Now we got a bunch of questions. Um, let me, let me start picking some Courtney Bish. The quote that stuck with me from Black Buck most is in the middle of every difficulty lies an opportunity. What advice uh, would you give our students listening to you tonight regarding seizing those opportunities through their most challenging times? Yeah, so that quote um, for folks who haven't read the book yet, that is from um, a man that some of us have heard of named Albert Einstein. And um, for me, what I would say to students um, regarding seizing those opportunities through their most challenging times is, first of all, take care of yourself. Be kind to yourself. Um, try not to judge yourself too much. Ask yourself why you're feeling the way that you're feeling. Again, observe and try to analyze and write while you're experiencing uh, whatever you're going through. And I know that I'm not answering the question directly because I, and I will, but I feel like people need to take care of themselves first as people before they put all of this pressure on themselves. And I know I did it and you heard it from my own journey before they put all of this pressure on themselves as a writer, as a creative, as a professional, as this, that, and the other, like you're a person first. Um, so I think that we need to take care of ourselves and, and, and love ourselves and give ourselves moments of grace. 
um, before looking to seize opportunities. Uh, in terms of seizing those opportunities, um, for those who are here and, and that you're a writer, you can write. <laughs> you can write about everything that you're experiencing and you can turn it into something if you want. For people who read my essays, especially some that I publish with Medium, I'm writing about things, uh, some traumatic things, and that's a whole other story that took place a decade ago, a decade and a half ago. And I, I might have not processed them. And then years later, I said, now it's time to write about them. And, uh, and I was able to get them out. So if you are a writer, Again, a writer is someone who takes writing seriously. You are a writer. You don't have to have a book out. Um, you can write about those things. And for those here who aren't writers and are going through some tough times, understand that those tough times aren't going to last and that you are going to come through. But there will likely be at least one, if not many, lessons through those tough times. So try to take what you can and use them to move yourself forward. Thank you. Okay. Keisha Cumberbatch said, what do you do to transition or create motivation if and when you have writer's block? And this is related, I believe, to Ian uh, Castellano's question of how do you deal with writer's block or just a sudden lack of creativity? So I have a routine and this routine um, has been, I don't want to say the word perfected because I constantly have to tweak it, but this routine has been created and iterated upon um, throughout a couple of years of me writing. And my routine begins the night before where I tell myself, you're writing the next day. So that when I wake up the following day, there are no ifs, ands, or buts. I'm writing the next day in the same way I'm going to brush my teeth, in the same way I'm going to eat, in the same way um, that I'm going to take a shower and do X, Y, Z. So my routine is also very thorough. And we don't <laughs> we have like five minutes left, so I'm not going to get into the whole thing. But my routine deals with meditation, deals with drinking my drink of choice, yerba mate, deals with waffles. It deals with sometimes wearing the same thing, um, dancing, music, to get myself into a heightened state of inspiration and creativity uh, where when I sit down and I bring my fingers to the key, I'm jazzed up, I'm energized and I'm ready to write. So my routine helps a lot in getting me to that place where I am creative. I'm not waiting for inspiration to hit me. But in those moments that I am like, damn, what's going on here? I don't know what I'm doing. I literally can't, I can bring my fingers to the key, but I feel like it's going to be gibberish. And um, it's going to make more work for me down the line, even though I try not to judge myself in the process. What I do then is say, this is not just not the time for me to write. I need to go out into nature. Me, I truly believe that nature has all the answers that we need. And if you can find the closest park or if some of you live, um, I've never been to Canton or, or that area, which I was just told is called the North County. I was telling, <laughs> I was telling RJ and uh, Phil before we hopped on that when folks discuss where Kent is located, it sounds like some Game of Thrones type thing where it's in the north and there's a king of the north. I'm from, I'm from down here, so I don't know what it's like over there, but I'm sure that there's a wilderness and there's a lot of uh, forests around there. So for me, I go out into nature, I listen to music, I eat a good meal, I cook, uh, I talk to people who build me up. I have so many tools to help lift me back up. And to help me remember that tomorrow was another day for me to get after it. And just because I didn't do it as well as I wanted today in terms of writing or the words didn't flow, that's not a failure, whatever. Maybe I succeeded in other days. I try to always count the wins that I have throughout a day, no matter how big or small, or create wins for myself, uh, just so that I could feel better and then come to the page the next day with energy. So those are just a few things that I do. Um, hopefully that helps. Thank you both for that question. Any others? I think I could do one more and then I'll, I'll bring Phil back on to say a few words. Last question. Maybe someone will unmute themselves and ask it. If no one else does, I've got kind of a, a big question and it All might right. be a little, it might be a little too big for the last three minutes. Well, let's try it. So, you know, much of your novel, your, your protagonist or your protagonist, like, kind of like what he settles into is his goal, you know, his, his goal becomes much bar larger than himself, right? He, he decides that he, and, and kind of against his, 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 his own interests, like he decides that he wants to help others, right? Like he's kind of thrust into this, this life of service. Mm -hmm. right? And, and, you know, and the, and the novel ends up becoming about social change and the, and the push for social change. Yep. You know, what's really interesting to me about it is, 
is that this group of people in your novel choose to work for social change within the confines of capitalism, like within like and and choose it. And this is a really, you know, this is something I think a question that that I have of myself, you know, is how do we how do we inspire social change? Mm -hmm. uh, can we do it within the confines of you know our 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 current kind of socioeconomic uh, system? You know, um, and I would just love to hear your, some of your thoughts on that, given like you know the current climate that we're in, given the current situation that we're in, uh, and given that given that so much of your book is is really about um, uplifting uplifting you know people. Uh, inspiring change, inspiring change, you know, and social change, like, where you fall on that, you know, like, and it doesn't have to necessarily be, you know, a manifesto, but, um, you know, how we best, how we best can, can change this world. Yeah. Well, that last part is big and we definitely don't have time for how we can change this world, but um, <clears throat> thank you for that. And I'm going to get to uh, another question. I see that Jalen Jalen had one, but he couldn't be unmuted. So maybe he could write in the chat and we'll get to it after this. So um, you're right. Darren, uh, towards the latter half of the book, has this responsibility thrust upon him. And he does take up the mantle to help change the world in some small way in the way that he can and help others get ahead. Because he believes, as I do, that when we lift other people up, our arms get stronger as well. So I think that what's most important in changing the world, and again, this is vast, in just seeing what your role in that change can be, right? And not thinking that you need to save a thousand or 10,000 people in order to make a change. You can first change your sight, yourself and your life for the better, and then be in a better position to help other people, right? We all have our own gifts and purpose, purposes and experiences that could be to the benefit of other people. Even just being someone that someone can go to and tell their problems and issues and us listen to them without interrupting or thinking about what we want to say next, you're changing someone's day. You're changing, you might have just talked someone off the ledge. You never know where people are coming from. So um, reeling it back in a little bit though and talking about changing within this capitalist society, I do believe that it's possible. I do. Um, and I, I, I've never really said that most bluntly or, or, or as plainly as that, but I most definitely do. I'm an optimist. Um, and if I wasn't an optimist, then I probably wouldn't have written this book. I think that uh, we don't need to tear down this current system in order to help people. I think that things do need to change, and they are, especially when it comes to race in this nation, in this world. More conversations are at the forefront of society, I believe, than ever before. Maybe there were more in the 60s. I wasn't alive during then, but it feels like, at least in my life, and maybe some of you would agree, that more people now than ever are actually listening and want to listen and are having these difficult conversations. Um, so I'm hopeful for that, and I do believe that we can change. But in terms of the book, the book is incomplete to a certain extent because we see the happy campers, happy campers, which is this group that's helping young people of color infiltrate uh, tech startups, tech startup sales teams in America. And a lot of it is predicated on getting these people into these startups, uh, especially when they don't have a lot of black and brown folk in there. That is not the only way to liberation. That's just one way. There are some people who wanna create their own organizations. There are some people who want to work for other black and brown folk that are leading the organizations. Then there's some people who just wanna get the tools and then go better people in other ways without even creating organizations. Maybe they just wanna be a community advocate and so forth. There is no one way to help people. There's no one way to affect change. Um, so I think that that, that that would be helpful as well. Uh, Zvi Savadon said, uh, I always like Beckett's quote in Worst Word Ho, ever tried, ever failed no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. I'm definitely with that. And before we sign off, Jalen, I don't know if you could be unmuted, but would you like to, uh, if we can't unmute, would you like to ask your question in the chat before we go? Okay. <clears throat> Were you always very open with sharing your work? If not, how did you grow to be more comfortable with it? And who did you go to for good feedback and honest, honest opinions? So, um, with my essays, I wasn't open at all. Honestly, uh, with my essays, and, and if you go to MateaWrites.com or you look up any of my essays, you'll see 
um, why maybe I was hesitant. I was afraid of people that I knew reading them. So when I published them uh, with Medium and with the editors over there or with Catapult or with the Rumpus or whomever, I wasn't publicizing my work. I was like, okay, no one that I worked with or that I grew up with is going to know that I have these thoughts because I didn't want to expose myself in those ways to people trying to gaslight me, to people trying to tear me and my work and my thoughts and my feelings down or invalidate where I was coming from due to the environment that I grew up in and the environment that I worked in. Um, so I was, I, was, I was hesitant and I'm not gonna lie, I was afraid. But there was this one essay that I wrote and I read it to my younger brother. And after I read it out to him, he, he got quiet and he said, I've had many of these same experiences and I didn't really know that you had the same. I wish that this is something that I had read when I was younger. So some of the fear that I had, some of the, the, the uh, hesitancy or trepidation that I had of putting my work out there or promoting it, it was still there, but I said, I got to promote it now. I need to stand by it. So that helped me gain the necessary courage that when I was writing Black Buck, um, I was going to share it with some people before pitching agents, but I was going to be careful about who I shared it with. I had to trust the people that I was sharing it with, trust that they would understand where I was coming from. And if not, that they would be able to articulate their confusion in a way that I'd be able to receive. Um, I needed to trust their opinions, even if they weren't writers, I had to trust their artistic sensibilities and, and believe that they would be able to again, convey their thoughts rather than just saying, cool work. Yeah. Or this, I don't really like it. Like for anyone who's been in a workshop, like, you know what I'm talking about? Um, so I was careful because not all feedback is created equally Jalen. And who did I go to for good feedback and honest opinions? Yeah. Just some close friends, just like two or three, uh, whom I trusted with that. I'm going to thank, uh, SUNY Canton the living writer series for having me. Um, this was such a blast. We ended up having so many questions and I didn't have to just like talk at my face, which would have been weird and I never liked doing. Um, I'm grateful for all of you who attended tonight's talk. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to drop some of my info right now in the chat. If you uh, ever want to chat or you have your own questions, uh, feel free to just reach out to me. The first uh, piece of information is uh, my Twitter and my Instagram. Um, I often chat with people there about writing. And the second, of course, is uh, my email, Mateo at MateoWrites.com. I'm wishing all of you well, a great evening. Be safe, be happy, be well. Phil, any last words? Thank you, thank you so much. That was a ton of fun. Uh, I feel so lucky that we, uh, that we had you with us here tonight and uh, that we're a part of your journey. Uh, I know I'm gonna continue to watch your, uh, your trajectory. Thank you. And uh, I'm really hoping that that next book comes out and um, we can bring you up here in person and you can experience the North Country uh, firsthand. Oh yeah. See, oh, yeah. Uh, see what it's like up here north of the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. I'm already looking forward to it. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, um, RJ. And thank everyone else. Have a great evening. Yep. And thanks to everybody else for joining us. Our next event will be, uh, I believe, May 5th. So keep an eye out for it. We have poet Chase Bergrun joining us. Uh, please keep an eye out for that event. And thanks again for all of you tuning in and everybody be well, be safe and um, keep on keeping on.